Whether it was bloody sneak attacks or the threat of scalping enemy soldiers, both British Redcoats and rebellious colonial patriots witnessed and committed some pretty messed up things during the American Revolution. By the 18th century, many European powers were quick to acknowledge that certain prisoners of war had rights. In the American Revolution, however, captured colonists were understood to be traitors. This means that their treatment varied quite a bit, sometimes veering into brutal territory. One British general even ominously said that captured patriots were, quote, destined to the core, that is, that they would be hanged if they were ever in British custody. The issue went both ways. While Americans captured by the British could face harsh, even squalid conditions that threatened their health, loyalists could experience much of the same, or at least they said they did. In the Aysgill affair, captured British Captain Charles Aysgill was ordered executed by George Washington after loyalists hanged Continental Army Captain Jack Huddy. Aysgill wasn't executed, but he alleged that his time as a prisoner was one of very poor treatment indeed. Washington denied the assertion. When a military figure in the American Revolution earns the nickname Bloody Ben, you know the origin story of that name has got to be pretty messed up. And for Lieutenant Colonel Bannister Tarleton, it's been so notorious that his name became shorthand for brutality. In May 1780, Tarleton was commanded to stamp out any remnants of rebellion in the colony of South Carolina. On May 29th, near Waxhalls, Tarleton and his troops surrounded and defeated a group of patriots. The group, consisting of about 350 men, surrendered. After that surrender, however, British soldiers continued shooting. Ultimately, 113 colonists were killed and 203 captured in the Battle of Waxhaws, compared to 19 British dead. The event became emblematic of British brutality for the rest of the war, used by pro-patriot sources to bolster their cause and further the perception of the British as bloodthirsty, heinous overlords. Most striking, it gave rise to the term Tarleton's Quarter, a darkly ironic phrase that meant a victor would give no mercy at all but would instead vengefully kill everyone despite the rules of engagement. Since the days of the Revolutionary War, tarring and feathering has gotten an almost mythical reputation. For many modern readers, the idea of coating someone in hot tar followed by a layer of loose feathers sounds both humiliating and utterly painful. But how messed up was it really? First, there are no reports that tarring and feathering ever killed anyone, yet it could still be pretty brutal. Some people could suffer blisters from the hot tar, while an angry mob certainly wasn't above landing a few good kicks and blows during the process. The main point of tarring and feathering was to inflict psychological suffering. A person who was subjected to the treatment was displayed for others to gawk at. One man, a sailor named George Gaylor, was tarred and feathered in 1769 for working with British customs. You approve a brutal and illegal act to enforce a political principle, Sam! Afterward, his captors reportedly paraded their victim around in a cart, occasionally whipping him for three hours. Gaylor clearly survived, given that he later sued a number of his attackers, but was also obviously upset over the humiliation of the incident. If you were a supporter of the Patriot cause but didn't want to fight, then you might choose to be an activist in your hometown. After all, what danger could there be in vocally supporting the cause from your home, at least compared to what others were risking? Turns out, you could risk quite a lot. Take the case of the town of Falmouth, which is now known as Portland, Maine. This colonial stronghold was attacked by Royal Navy ships in 1775, which bombarded the town and destroyed over 400 buildings. To be fair, the commander of the squadron gave the townspeople warning that he was about to attack, reading a formal notice that accused them of unpardonable rebellion. The attack soon became a powerful symbol for the Patriot cause. And why Falmouth, then not one of the other many settlements along the coast that were deemed just as rebellious? The weather simply made it easier for the group of ships to make it to Falmouth. A similar attack happened in Fairfield, Connecticut in 1779. There, 97 homes and 48 businesses were burned. Residents were offered land in Ohio, then owned by Connecticut, which came to be colorfully known as the Firelands. Though many of us now remember George Washington as a stern-looking, white-haired old man on the dollar bill, the real George Washington was, of course, more complicated. And for some people, he was no noble leader or founder of a new nation. He was a devourer of villages. Washington was given the nickname Devourer of Villages by the leader of the Seneca tribe, itself part of the larger Iroquois Confederacy. The nickname was first granted to Washington's great-grandfather, John Washington, who was part of an attempt to suppress a native rebellion that left five chiefs dead, all after they had already agreed to negotiate. While George himself didn't have anything to do with his great-grandfather's misdeeds, he arguably earned the name later in the American Revolution. During the war, Washington gave the go-ahead to General John Sullivan to take Continental soldiers and devastate Iroquois settlements after indigenous people sided with the British. Soldiers destroyed their crops, burned down structures, took prisoners, and violated graves. 
Washington himself was at the forefront of the plan, telling Sullivan to make sure he accomplished the total destruction and devastation of their settlements and the capture of as many prisoners of every age and sex as possible. Throughout the war, quite a few enslaved people living in the colonies sided with the British. That's because the British were largely seen as potential liberators, to the point where one man even renamed himself British Freedom. For black Americans, the Patriots were more frequently enslavers who wanted to keep them in bondage. The British were more amenable to freeing slaves, though they didn't outlaw slavery in most of their territories until 1833. Still, for many enslaved people, it must have looked far better over on the British side. That was made all the more attractive when some British officers began promising freedom for slaves who fought on their side. Quite a few sided with the British, including people ostensibly owned by George Washington and Thomas Jefferson. After the war ended, they were faced with the undoubtedly depressing prospect of returning to their old lives. Both Washington and Jefferson took steps to reclaim their slaves in the aftermath of the Revolution. Though it's been traditionally associated with Native American attacks, the truth is that both colonists and British forces used scalping throughout the war to terrorize the other side. Or at least, they used the threat of scalping. According to Groundless, rumors, legends, and hoaxes on the early American frontier, there are some accounts from soldiers on both sides that the enemy scalped deceased combatants. Some of the more horrific stories maintain some soldiers were scalped while still alive, while others are more vague about the type of mutilation that was said to have occurred. There is a good chance, however, that scalping was more of a horrifying rhetorical device and may not have happened nearly as often as those accounts suggest. Whether or not it actually happened on the battlefield, the idea that the enemy, regardless of the side, scalped their foes was held up as an example of their brutality. Printers went wild with accusations, printing pamphlets and newspapers purporting to carry true accounts of scalping. Some patriot-friendly sources used stories of scalping hunting loyalists as a way to bolster support for the rebellion. If you were a rebellious colonial, undoubtedly you didn't want to be captured by the British. Take this one to Camden. Here's a spy. Hang him, put his body on display. Some prisoners of war could be treated pretty humanely if they were lucky and perhaps of a higher profile than the rest. But the truly unlucky would be put in prison so harsh that the barbarity of their conditions remains notorious more than two centuries after it happened. The worst of the worst were the prison ships anchored near Manhattan. Rebels were more likely to die aboard one of those floating prisons than they were on the field of battle. Specifically, an estimated 11,000 people died on prison ships alone during the American Revolution. Living conditions aboard the ships were atrocious. Prisoners were packed below decks, leading to overheating, the spread of disease, and criminal neglect. Some aboard the ships reported that the dead would lie amongst the living for days, and when they were finally discovered by British soldiers, would simply be tossed overboard. Nearby people in Brooklyn would sometimes recover the remains on shore and give them a proper burial. Food was especially heinous, it seems, with meals made up of rotten, moldy ingredients and foul water drawn directly from the East River. The HMS Jersey became especially notorious for its conditions, to the point where prisoners nicknamed it simply Hell. The stark political divides in colonial America were not only distressing from an interpersonal standpoint, but they could also grow deeply violent. Anti-loyalist mobs menaced British sympathizers with social ostracization and physical violence, even killing some. Colonel Charles Lynch, a Virginia military man, was so notorious for his propensity to kill loyalists that the term lynching supposedly comes from his actions. Violence grew so bad that it pushed some loyalists to flee the American colonies. Liberty's Exiles notes that many of these refugees left the rebellious colonies for other British territories, especially the northern colonies that would become part of Canada. British soldiers' fears of mob violence grew to considerable proportions, to the point where it played a part in the Boston Massacre. That bloody incident was precipitated by British troops arriving in 1768 Boston, a city already resistant to redcoats. By 1770, relations had grown even worse. When a young Boston man entered into an argument with a sentry in front of the customs house, the altercation grew to involve a small group of British soldiers and a steadily growing mob of Bostonians. When someone hit a soldier, the British fired into the crowd, lending even more credence to the image of bloodthirsty British soldiers. A secret attack is not necessarily a standout horror of war, though it's bound to be violent and potentially bloody nonetheless. Yet one secret attack of the American Revolution proved to be yet more fodder for the perceived brutality of British soldiers. It happened near Paoli, Pennsylvania. There, on September 20, 1777, 5,000 British soldiers commanded by General Charles Gray descended upon colonial troops and camped there. To maintain the element of surprise, the British declined to use their loud muskets and instead planned to rely on hand-to-hand -hand weapons like their bayonets to kill the sleeping American soldiers. The colonials lost 272 men who were either killed or taken as prisoners of war. 
Later accounts by Americans alleged that some British soldiers had killed people who had already surrendered. The Paoli Massacre, as it came to be known, was eventually made another emblem of British outrages against patriots. Later in the war, the commander of the American troops who were killed led a charge against Stony Point, New York, which recalled some of the worst elements of the attack at Paoli. The Continental soldiers also attacked at night, using only their bayonets to kill 94 enemy soldiers and capture 472 more. Even the most scrupulously neutral and mundane people living in the colonies at the time of the American Revolution simply could not escape the war. Even if they refused to participate in battles, mob violence, or any of the other myriad ways in which people engaged with the conflict, it still could come to their front door. The everyday impact of the war was widespread, with military action happening from Georgia to the northern reaches of New England. Both British and Continental armies moved broadly through that vast region, passing through settlements as densely occupied as cities and as remote as lonely single-family farms. Colonial Americans were also often confronted by the violence of nearby battles and war-induced food shortages, which put considerable pressure on even the simplest day-to-day -day lives. The movement of demanding and hungry troops through the land could be especially devastating. Soldiers often took whatever they wanted, sometimes with a semi-formal requisition, sometimes not. Crops, farm animals, and even wood from buildings and fences could be fair game. Some rumors even suggest that troops would claim women for their own as they passed through. It got so bad that some families chose to abandon their homes to become refugees as troops approached. Check out one of our newest videos right here! Plus, even more grunge videos about your favorite stuff are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.